five or okay, six p.m. in Central European time. Um, my name is Tomek Wodarski. I'm I'm from Polonium Foundation, and I'm really happy to ah maybe we should wait for like one minute or two minutes more. Just to make sure that everyone was is able to join us. Um, have like a music in the background that's i always keep forgetting about that because it's always like awkward those two or three minutes crickets of, crickets. Like, of crickets yes <laughs> something like that it will be nice to have some music in the background for that um, Sometimes I'm getting like a, a lot of noise from outside because I live close to a very busy road, which is not fun when you have to try to give a talk when suddenly there is like ambulance just in front of your window. So I hope it will not happen at least in the first two minutes. Okay, maybe one more minute. I don't know. I can't see how many, if everyone is joining or not. I hope they are. We have 23 people now. Okay. Yes, people are joining. Oh, that's good. Okay. That's good. It's 23 of us now. Okay, I think I'll, because I, I need to also say a few technical things, so I think I can start. So, okay, hello again. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you on our, I think it's 12th webinar of the series. I think I'm not mistaken. Um, as some of you may know, we introduced those webinars last year in, just because the, the pandemic was kind of, did not allow us to have regular meetings, which we usually have at least one or two conferences per year. So we decided to, to, um, to start this webinar series. And First of all, if you would like to learn more about upcoming events, you can visit our webpage, Polonium Foundations. There are also, we are also present at almost every possible, um, uh, possible social media. So please follow us there for more news about the, the webinars or any other our activities. Uh, also, we are very excited that the NAVA, the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange is partner of this, of this endeavor of the webinars. Uh, moreover, we started last year Polonium Network, which is a portal for Polish scientists and also people who are interested in science in Poland. So please check this uh, portal as well and register if you think it will be useful for you. And there will be, of course, questions after Maria's presentation. And there are two ways of, 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 of participating in, in question time. One, you can always type a question during the presentation and I will try to read it and ask Maria the question after the talk. Or you can, of course, you can uh, always, uh, after, after the talk, you can, you, can, you can also type the question and you can also use the raise hand button, which then I will unmute you and you will have a chance to ask the question uh, directly. Okay, I think I, I have covered all of the technical things. So now let me introduce our speaker. Uh, so Maria is a nuclear physicist uh, and she is interested in universe, why universe is as it is. And she is especially studying this, the structure of matter, which we are, all of us are built or formed from. And she using, she's using theoretical physics and experimental data coming from large particle colliders in order to study this. this fundamental aspects of, of structure of matter. Uh, Maria uh, studied at university, Aguilan, studied physics at Aguilanian University, and then for PhD, she moved to Germany, University of Cologne. And after gradu graduating, she started her postdoc adventure in US. And I believe I, I'm, is, all the physics names are quite long and complicated. So I will just try to read it without making a lot of mistakes. So now, as far as I understand, she works at Nuclear Science Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And she works with spin and cold QCD group at START Experiment at Brookhaven National Laboratory as well. 
And yes, so without further ado, Maria, the Zoom is yours. I think you can start sharing the screen. Thank you so much. I think you have to stop sharing so I can oh, yes, start sharing. <laughs> Okay. Here we are. One second. Okay. Very good. So I just would like to have a confirmation that you can hear me, you can see my slides, and you can see my pointer. Yes, everything is perfect. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, great. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to connect with all of you here. Um, and today I would like to tell you something about how we physicists peek inside the proton and how we study the fundamental structure of matter, especially with the STAR experiment, which I am a part of. I mean, not the part of experiment, the part of the collaboration. Uh, but before starting uh, talking about particle and nuclear physics, I would like to tell a few words about myself. So I am Maria and I fight with detectors. So this picture actually uh, shows, first of all, that my favorite cartoon character is Little Mai from Moomins. It's me as Little Mai. And also it shows that I did my PhD in Germany because in Germany there is this tradition that after your graduation, you receive a graduation hat made by your colleagues, uh, which repre represents you know, something from your work. So here I fight with the detector because when I was you know, doing my PhD, I was walking around and you know, complaining to my colleagues as we usually do during our PhD, like, oh, oh my God, I have to fight with my data, I have to fight with my calibration, which of course I meant not literal fighting, but rather struggling with some problems. So they made me fighting with my detector. So this is my detector spitting data on me uh, with, you know, photomultipliers, tubes, all cables. And this picture also, also shows the important roles of mentors in my life who are the corner people who you know, do not interrupt during the fight, but then they kind of give you good advice when it's time for that. Um, so currently I'm a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is closely connected with UC Berkeley here in the US. Uh, and it was actually the place where the particle accelerator, uh, first particle accelerator was constructed. So it's a great place to be as a particle and nuclear physicist. Um, and, uh, you know, this is everything now, but actually 14 billion years ago, our universe was born in the Big Bang. But actually what happened in the very first seconds, uh, just after that, determined the structure of matter we are all made of. Uh, so in the very beginning, universe was hot, dense, and filled only with the most fundamental building blocks of matter called elementary particles. And then while extending and cooling, protons, neutrons, and eventually atoms were created. So this picture is just an illustration, not to scale, you know, it's just, uh, just an illustration of the evolution of, of uh, our universe. Um, so usually people associate this picture with um, astronomy or astrophysics, but particle physicists are trying to reproduce conditions few seconds just after the Big Bang to study the fundamental structure of matter, and this would actually happen the very first few seconds um, after the beginning of our universe. So uh, you can see here, you know, the, 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 the size of the visible universe was growing. Also the time here and the, te the temperature was getting lower. The time is, you know, growing in this direction. And here you can see um, our experiments, which can probe the matter uh, at this particular stage of our universe. So you have here the LHC, which you probably heard about. Uh, and I work at RIC, which is Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. 
Uh, here we have more or less what we can probe, so nucleons, which we can probe uh, from heavy ion collisions. I am somewhere between here and here because I work with protons. So about 10 to 2 seconds after the Big Bang, the nuclei were formed, and about no, 3 hundred-thousand years after the beginning of the universe, roughly, uh, the atoms were formed. So when we look at the fundamental structure of matter, you usually see this kind of picture. So we have an atom. Here we have a helium atom. One more time. It's not a real scale concerning this nucle nucleus here, um, which is surrounded by the cloud of electrons and the typical let's say size of the atom is one angstrom um, which is 10 to minus 10 of meter and then you see you know we go like deeper and deeper and deeper and we see protons and neutrons which are building the nucleus and then inside protons and neutrons maybe you heard about we have quarks and gluons this picture is okay but the one thing which i'm usually complaining about is that this picture is static we don't know how uh you know fr from this picture we could see like okay the matter is like lego bricks we just build one on top of each other or we just go deeper and deeper but there is by far more and everything what's happening for example inside proton and neutron is extremely dynamic and we'll be talking today about these interactions and i will tell you how we can probe this is what actually is inside the proton. So the simplest hydrogen, the center of the simplest hydrogen atom, where we have one electron uh, on the shell, is uh, the proton. And uh, you know, in my research, I ask first of all if proton is a most fundamental particle. We already know that it's not; that it has its uh, internal structure, and the. Uh, analogy which is which I often give to people is that um, you know hydrogen atom can be compared to a um, ballet dance to a quantum mechanical ballet dance it's well organized it's well uh, described we have proton in the center and one electron dancing elegantly around the center of the atom while the proton could be compared rather to like a mosh pit during the rock concert when drunk people are dancing and bumping into each other. So it's extremely messy. So if someone asked me what actually the proton is, I would answer the proton is a mess in general. So proton is full of uh, elementary particles called, as we know, quarks, also anti-quarks, so antimatter equivalence uh, partners of quarks and gluons which are the particles which as the name says glue everything together so here for example we have an one more time some sort of artistic illustration of the interior of the proton so we have there three quarks three net quarks we can say main quarks we call that it, we call it valence quarks um, Two so-called upwards is just the terminology. They are not located up or down. It's just the name. Upwards and one down quark, we have which have different electric charge, which sums up to charge uh, one of the proton. Um, and we have also lots of gluons. So this particles which glue everything together and they are carriers of strong interactions which I will be talking a bit about today uh, and we have also transient quark uh, transient uh, pairs of quarks and antiquarks so okay here we can also see okay we have all these particles inside but the important thing is that all of this, all these elementary particles inside are extremely dynamic. Everything is moving. They're moving. They are moving almost with the speed of light. They are rotating and they are closed in this teeny tiny proton. So how we describe the interaction between quarks and gluons. So uh, first of all, we were talking about um, 
you know, about nucleus, which is somewhere in the middle in the, uh, in the atom, and it's extremely tiny. And we have, we have the proton and inside the proton, there are all these crazy quarks and gluons, you know, moving inside. So generally, when we think about it, the force, the interaction which holds it together, a force which, you know, puts it all together has to be extremely strong to keep it, not to just break and go everywhere. So the interactions between quarks and gluons are called strong interactions. And they are one of the four fundamental interactions um, in our world. We have, uh, we have electromagnetic interactions, we have uh, gravity, gravitational interactions, we have weak interactions which are responsible for a radioactive decays, for example, and we have strong interactions which keep uh, quarks and gluons inside the proton. So since the proton is extremely tiny, uh, we probably also can imagine that the theory which will be describing um, these interactions should be a quantum theory because we act on the really microscopic way. So the theory which describes interaction between quarks and gluons uh, is a quantum field theory and it's called quantum chromodynamics. Chromo is related with colors. Uh, it is not exactly that uh, quarks have colors. It's just that when we talk, for example, about uh, electromagnetic interactions and we have charge. So we know that particle can have positive or negative charge. If they have different charges, they will attract, etc. cetera. Um, in case of quantum chromodynamics and uh, quarks, we have three different types of uh, charges and three called colors and also three different anti-colors. So in the end, we have six different, uh, different we can say charges with physicists uh, love analogies. So they use this uh, colors to, to, describe, uh, to describe these different types of charges in quantum chronodynamics. So there's few very interesting properties um, of strong interactions. So I mentioned before that uh, gluons are the particles which you know, carry the strong interactions, which glue quarks together. Uh, in electromagnetic interactions, it will be a photon. Uh, here we have a gluon. And gluon has this uh, interesting property that it actually has a color charge. It actually carries a um, color and anti-color. Uh, and this also makes it makes it um, very, you know, it makes it possible that uh, gluons can interact between each other. Photons cannot. And this had the whole like sort of implications uh, for the properties of these interactions. Um, of course, about you know quantum chronodynamics, you can talk a lot, and you know it can be a half a year course uh, at your university about quantum field theory, about quantum chronodynamics also including quantum chromodynamics. Uh, but the few properties which maybe feel, you know, a bit counterintuitive for some of us, um, or, you know, can be, can be a bit weird, are uh, color confinement and asymptotic freedom. So often, I said physicists love analogy. So I will use analogy <laughs> to describe the strong interactions using a rubber band. I hope that you can see, you can see my camera. So there's a rubber band. Um, so actually the strength of the strong interactions uh, is growing when the distance between quarks is growing, which can be a bit weird because if you have, for example, two magnets and you know, you, you orient them in the way that they attract each other, you know that when they move, when you move them far away, uh, the interaction will be weaker between, between two of them. It is different for quarks. So, you know, you can imagine that quarks are um, kind of bind together with a rubber band. So when you go further and further, it's more and more difficult to pull them apart. Um, 
but I told that strong interactions are really extremely strong. So this, you know, the strength is so, so, uh, so, so enormous that actually it is impossible to pull uh, one, one quark uh, from another. Why it is happening? Uh, it is connected also with the, uh, with the property or the uh, phenomena on color confinement. So when we pull these quarks, you know, from each other, the, the strength of this interaction is so strong that uh, the force which we will have to apply to pull them apart is actually higher than the energy which is uh, required to produce a new quark anti quark pair. So when we put you know more and more energy to the system and we try to pull it pull it apart at some point this rubber band will break but immediately the pair of quark and anti quark will be produced and you can ask like oh how the quark anti quark can be produced out of nothing out of what yeah you see einstein had this uh, or introduced this kind of very um well-known equation that energy is equal to mass so if we give enough energy to the system from this energy actually the mass somehow can be produced so the energy can change into mass so yeah you cannot really pull apart to quark which is connected with color confinement in the way that we cannot see single quarks we cannot see single gluons and that the objects which we see like particles have to be color neutral so they all for example combine if we have proton uh, we can combine uh, red green and blue quark together and they will create the color neutral object and another thing is actually asymptotic freedom meaning the strong interaction is stronger when the distance is larger but it's weaker when we go very close to each other. So in case of proton, when quarks and gluons are really close to each other, they are, you know, confined in this tiny space. Actually, the interaction is very, very weak. So then if we go closer, you see, we have lots of freedom and then quarks and gluons are moving like crazy uh, inside the proton. If we try to go far away, we cannot escape the proton. But if we go close, everything is moving like crazy. Yeah, so this was a quantum chronodynamics explained on the rubber band. Um, <laughs> I hope you got some intuition. Um, but, you know, so I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I gave this slide because I wanted just to give you some sort of feeling uh, about this, what we do. So right now, the main question is, how can we probe the internal, internal structure of the proton? Why do we know all of this? How to look inside the proton? So there are uh, several approaches to it, but the main idea is that we smash the proton with another particle, which is a probe. And then depending on type of this probe, uh, we will be dominantly sensitive to particular type of, uh, of particles. And we can probe you know, the interaction between these uh, particles, study the debris of these collisions and interpret back what happened uh, between quarks and gluons and how they are distributed inside the proton. So two types of this kind of uh, interactions when we can probe the internal structure of proton of the proton uh, is, for example, something what we call deep inelastic scattering, which is the scat scattering of electrons uh, on the proton and its uh, constituents. So we accelerate uh, electrons. Uh, we can also accelerate electrons and protons. We smash them. Um, and then electrons are kind of entering the protons and they are interacting, for example, here with a quark uh, through mostly electromagnetic or weak interaction. Uh, if it's, for example, uh, let's imagine that this is just electromagnetic interaction. 
and then they are escaping uh, this interaction and something here is produced. We try to knock out the, um, the quark, for example, from the proton. And as we learned, if we try to knock it out, the new particles will be produced. So this is one type of the uh, measurement. So then in experiment, we measure, we measure electrons. Sometimes we can also measure some of these particles. And based on it, uh, we can track what happened inside the proton and uh, what is the distribution of, for example, quarks inside the proton. The other experiments, which actually I perform, are proton-proton collision. So in proton-proton collision, our probe will be uh, another quark or another gluon. So when we smash two protons, uh, we can, with enough energy, we can observe the direct interaction between, for example, gluon and gluon. And once again, when we try to, you know, pull them outside, uh, outside of the proton, knock them out, there will be a streams, the showers of particles uh, being produced at, as this energy. And we measure this, uh, these particles, and we can deduce, deduce uh, something about the internal, internal structure of the proton. So these are the amazing, basic, let's say, concepts of this, how we can probe what's inside the proton. So the general property of this kind of collision is that the more energy you pump into it, the more energy you have in this interaction, the messier structure of the proton you would see, meaning you can go deeper and deeper and you can see more of these gluons, for example, or quark and anti-quark pairs. So often when I was in, often people say, oh, proton is made out of free quarks. And when I was showing this picture with general structure of matter, as I said, it was static and we had their free quarks. So yeah, it is true in the sense that when we look at the proton at the low energy, the resolution is uh, good enough to see three main net quarks. But if we have more and more energy and we somehow go deeper and deeper, we see all this messy structure with uh, quarks, anti-quarks pairs and uh, gluons. So this is how we, uh, how we can go deeper and deeper and be more and more precise um, about the proton. Um, so here is an actual plot from one of the theoretical evaluation using data collected um, in mostly the experiments which I pre present you when we have um, scattering of, for example, electron on the proton. And uh, uh, I just wanted to introduce you how we describe the interior of the proton. Uh, I really don't want to go, you know, into details. It has to be a talk which is, you know, entertaining and kind of gives you with some feeling about this, what we do. Uh, but just for you to, to understand what I was talking about, about, this energy and messy structure and all these kind of things. So in physics, we describe in particle physics, nuclear physics, we describe the interior of the proton through this kind of one-dimensional parton distribution functions. So these functions are, uh, first of all, as a function of x. And what the heck is x? So x, we look at the particles inside the proton, and we kind of group them, or we look at them um, relative to their momenta. So when the particle, so the proton is moving, we look at the particles which are which carry particular fraction. Of, uh, of proton momenta. And usually in experiment, we can access, you know, with particular energy, we can access only particular range of this full momenta. So this X is just the fraction. So 50% will be the particles which carry 50% of momentum of the, um, of the proton. And uh, this Q square is just this, is a scale, is the energy which I was telling you about. So if we have more, uh, energy, the Q square will be larger. Uh, and we will have a bit better resolution of this what's inside the proton. So this, this function described, you can think about it about, uh, as about some sort of probability of observing or finding particular uh, particle inside the proton at particular x having particular resolution. 
So uh, here we can see the picture. This U, D, D bar, S, C, etc. These are the names of quarks which are inside the proton. U, D is up and down. And G is the gluon, and gluon generally grows very fast at low x. That's why here it's divided by 10. Um, so, you know, we read it that, for example, if we smash two particles and we strike something with the what has about, uh, you know, 10 to minus 10, uh, sorry, 10 to minus 1, so 0 0.1 of, uh, of proton momentum, momentum, it will be most probably D or U quark. Um, and U quark is more probable. So um, you can see that this picture is changing with the resolution. And uh, this phrase that we have three quarks is kind of related to the fact that we have these bumps uh, here. So if we go to the lower energy, the bumps of the free valence quarks are more and more prominent. And when we go to the higher energy, when we see more of the C quarks and everything, you know, and these gluons and, and um, generally everything is getting a bit, a bit smoother. So this is just for you to know how we describe it. Um, and this is an effort of several experimental collaborations and several theoretical collaborations. These are data collected for several years, for example, in the experiment um, at the Hera Collider, which was at DESI, uh, where they were smashing, they, they, were, they were looking at this deep inelastic um, scatterings. Um, so, you know, this is really, several measurements and several years of measurement to describe it. So this is the unpolarized uh, picture of quarks and gluons inside the proton. I will just explain what the unpolarized and polarized is in a second. So right now, something about the experiment. So uh, I told that uh, we smash protons almost with the speed of light, actually and study the debris of these collisions uh, in our experiment. So I work at the solenoidal tracker at RIC called STAR, and my experiment is located at the Brookhaven National Lab in the US, which is uh, close to New York, Long Island. So here you can see where the STAR experiment is located. This is our ring when we smash, pro accelerate and smash protons. Uh, here you can see a size of the car, for example. So it's a big ring, not as big as in LHC, but uh, in, in CERN and not as big as LHC, but uh, still impressive, I have to say. Uh, this is how my detector looks like. So um, I think I will give you a scale in the second. So generally particle and nuclear detectors, high energy nuclear detectors are built as an onion uh, around the interaction point. So we have protons, for example, smashing together, there is the interaction point, and around this interaction point, you have different types of detectors which can measure different things, like momentum of the particle, or energy of the particle, or the vertex, so where the interaction really uh, was, or they can help us to identify what types of particles were escaping this interaction, uh, and several different things. So, um, angles, for example, position, etc. So this is like onion structure. And this is usually what uh, we see. I mean, this is, of course, reconstruction. This is the cross section and the beam is going, you know, from outside to the screen. Um, and when two actually here heavy ions uh, smash together, we have several, I mean, thousands uh, of particles produced, produced, and they are all registered in our detector. So these are tracks of particles which escape this interaction point. Oh, here we are. So this is the uh, star detector is not as large as, for example, ATLAS or CMS in LHC, but it's still impressively large. So this is me, and this is our end cap. So it's the you know the end detectors of uh, of our. Uh, of our detector system. So you can see how it looks like here. I managed to take a picture of the beam pipe. So the pipe where the beam of uh, particles is getting in, going inside the detector. 
And here's me during one of the shifts. So usually particle experiments operate in the mode of um, collecting data for several months during the year. So usually it's about eight months, I think, for us, eight, nine months. Um, and our collaboration is about, um, consists of about, I think, 500 people currently. And all these 500 people are on our publication. This is how it works. And uh, we all meet together. These people are performing different analysis. Uh, everyone has to be all the time at the uh, control room when the detector is uh, operating. So we have people, uh, separate people responsible for delivering beam and making sure that the beam quality is good. Then we have people responsible for um, you know, for detectors and checking if they are operating properly, people responsible for uh, data acquisition, uh, so-called triggers uh, to, you know, register our data in the detector. And we also, and on top of that, of course, people are performing analysis. So everyone is kind of contributing to collecting this data and then you can work on them. So data are available and you can in principle pick any data sample you want from any year. Um, to analyze and, uh, you know, kind of look into particular aspects of either proton-proton interactions, or we also do heavy ion collisions, so heavy ion uh, interactions. Okay, so before this, I would like to show you two things. So one thing is that I was trying to, uh, this is actually real uh, time. This is uh, the... Um, picture of the central detector of our, I mean, it's central, it's a, um, it's a tracking detector in our, in, in STAR. And this is what's happening now. I was very angry today morning because I learned that they do some maintenance related to the um, uh, beams. And actually there are no real collisions in our detector. So we just collect the uh, cosmic particles and we do it. Um, for calibration purposes um, and, and others. Um, so at least you can see the cosmic uh, showers here and there popping out in the detector. It's not the detector is empty all the time. We just take every, um, every you know, uh, some event to display uh, here. So here you can see the cross section of the uh, tracking detector and the cosmic rays from all from all around. Um, so yeah, this is real time, it's February 24th. Uh, I don't know exactly what time is there. Okay, because it's GMT. Yeah, so it's happening, it's happening currently. So we're a bit unfortunate, but at least you can see that something, something is happening. Usually we have pictures, as I showed you, this blue tracks everywhere in the detector. And I also, uh, but I prepared instead a uh, video, this is from, I know that I prepared it. This is from LHC, so I'm uh, using their educational materials. But I think, I mean, generally the uh, thing, the, 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 how it works is very similar. So you have like a set of accelerators which are accelerating particles to the final uh, to the final energy. And here we don't have the gravity inside the uh, inside the. Um, beam channels and we just, you can see that here we accelerate protons. We have protons with uh, moving quarks inside and then we have protons from one side in the beam and protons from other side, um, which are colliding in the central part of the detector. And here you can see a showers, so-called jets of particles, which are ex, um, escaping this kind of interaction and they are being registered in the detector. So of course we don't see the tracks, we just reconstruct them later, but this is more or less what is happening. Okay. We were here. Okay, so for this, whoops, one second. Here we are. Okay, so right now I would like to tell you briefly what, um, I mean, what exactly my analysis is and why am I looking inside the proton and what I want to find there. 
So my main question of the research is how does the spin of the proton uh, originate from its, you know, messy mosh pit structure? So how does it, how, I mean, what's the origin of the spin and how does it come from uh, quarks and gluons? So first of all, spin, um, I mean, some of you are probably familiar with spin, some of you may be less. So I will put some, you know, few small introduction here. So spin is a very fundamental property of every particle as fundamental as mass or charge, electric charge, for example. So protons behave in some way as uh, spinning tops, but this uh, spin is rather a um, internal quantum mechanical property of every particle. A spin is actually connected with magnetic properties of a particle. So if particle with spin, it will be traveling through magnetic field, it will behave like a small magnet, small quantum mechanical magnet. But in a, like in a broader sense, spin is really an essential property in nature, which um, determines the or uh, the term is the stability of matter. It is responsible for ordering electrons and um, nuclei in atoms and molecules. And it, you know, makes possible uh, or rather decides about the stability of matter and how it is structured on a bit larger, let's say scale, on the scale of maybe chemistry or biology. So we hear about spin, for example, um, you know, in case of like ordering of electrons or number of electrons of the atomic shells, if someone works, you know, with chemistry here. So we know that there can be particular number and they have to be ordered in particular way. Um, and the spin of the proton, uh, as I said, is the quantum mechanical property um, and it's exactly one half and it can be oriented up or down. So you can, for the sake of this talk, you can think about it that the spin is kind of the vector, kind of describing the rotation of, um, of the proton. The proton is not really rotating, it's more a pro internal property of the particle, but we can think about it in this way. So the question which uh, people were asking for a long time and thought that actually, I mean, they know already the answer is how, I mean, or does proton spin really originate only from its free net quarks? People think, okay, we have free net quarks. Net quarks also have spin one half. So if the proton has spin one half, we can have, you know, two spins with uh, spin up, two quarks with spin up, one with spin down. It sums up to one half. We are done. We can go home. But the experiments which actually probed the uh, spin of quarks inside the proton um, actually showed that quarks contribute only to about 25 to 30% of proton spin. So the question is, where does proton spin really originate from? What are the other contributions? So when we think about this, you know, messy mosh pit structure of the proton, uh, we think, okay, there are quarks, but there are also some other things inside and everything is moving. So uh, spin of proton origin ha can have also its origin in spins of gluons, which are inside. So these gluing particles, gluons also have spin uh, equal to one. And then also the internal motion, the rotation, the angular momentum of um, quarks and gluons inside. So uh, how, how do we probe the uh, spin of the proton? So, you know, we already talked that if you want to probe the internal structure of the proton, we just smash protons. Uh, and that's it. Here, if we want to work with spins, we use particular property of our accelerated protons, which can be actually achieved at this energy only at the relativistic heavy ion collider in Brookhaven, uh, which is polarization. So we can um, orient, we, we can smash particles beam with the spin oriented in the particular uh, particular direction. 
So we can smash spins which, uh, uh, sorry, beams with spins which are um, anti-parallel or the ones which are parallel. Uh, so we can have one spin flipped. And we are on top of just smashing protons. We also use this property that we, that we know how the spins of the protons were oriented when we measure something. Uh, okay, and then the question is how we can access gluons, how we know that these are gluons which interacted. So at this energy, uh, when we observe, for example, one or two jets of particles, most I mean two jets of particles escaping the interaction, we know that these were mostly gluons uh, which interacted inside. So this is how you know we can probe uh, really the interaction of of gluons or gluons and quarks inside the proton. So what we do, we actually measure a uh, sort of asymmetry. So we count the number of jets which were produced when the uh, spins of the colliding beams were antiparallel and the number of jets which were produced when one spin was flipped. And from this asymmetry, this imbalance, we can uh, deduce using the properties of quantum chromodynamics to uh, what extent the spins of gluons inside the proton are aligned with the spin of the proton and how much they do contribute uh, to, the total, to the total spin of the proton. Uh, so here are actually my real um, plots from my experiment. Uh, so just so, I mean, to let you know briefly how it looks like and give you some feeling about this asymmetry. So here you can see, for example, the asymmetry where we count uh, single jets in our, uh, in our collisions. And here I present it as a function, it's called transverse momentum. Transverse momentum is the uh, simply momentum which um, this kind of jet has in the transverse direction. So this is related in some way to the X, which I was telling you about, to the fraction of the fraction of the total total uh, momentum, which gluons are uh, and partons are, you know, carrying um, inside the proton. Uh, and here you can see that our asymmetries are, you know, of the order of um, two to four percent and and uh, growing a bit with X. We can also do it for a pairs of um, of jets, for example. So you can see also here that this data. OK, that this is an expert. Um, I mean, our new our new uh, data are presented here. So this is our green points and this are data. Uh, this were data collected in 2015. Um, and analyzed uh, only recently. I mean, for all these years, there are several things which has to happen to have this da data uh, data really analyzed. And here's the comparison to our previous measurement and the same for digets. Let me check time, okay. So what have we learned? I'm finishing slowly. So we learned that, uh, you know, including this uh, results in the global analysis of all the world data, um, we learned that gluons carry, uh, the gluons that carry about 5% of the proton's momentum uh, contribute to about 40% to the proton spin. But when we look, so here I'm again just showing, uh, do not be scared about this plot. So there's again X and here I'm showing this delta G is something similar to the parton distribution function I was showing you, but it describes how much gluons contribute to the proton spin. So we see that it's indeed positive uh, in the range which we can measure, but we can see that at the low x, so the low momentum fractions, we have very large uncertainty. So there are several years in front of us really to understand uh, completely, you know, the, the spin of the proton and understand how spins of quarks and uh, gluons are aligned and also understand um, 
you know how it is connected with like three D structure of uh, of proton. So the future is the electron ion collider, which is the collider which will be colliding electrons and ions. We are very creative uh, with naming, and it will be located in Brookhaven National Lab. Um, so I think uh, we were just before before this uh, webinar, we were discussing with Tomasz that the timescales of our experiments can be very different depending on the discipline. So the plan for electron ion collider to start collecting data is more or less, I think, 10 years now from now. Um, so thanks to it, we will be able to look even deeper into the proton and understand even better the fundamental structure of matter and, um, you know, understand a bit probably or get closer to understanding uh, why our universe exists as it is and why the interactions in our universe are uh, as it is. So uh, I would like to thank uh, you for connecting. I hope that you will have lots of uh, questions. I would like to thank again the organizers. This is um, the view from my lab. And it's the lab with like the best view ever. Uh, this is our advanced light source. This is the San Francisco Bay. Um, this is San Francisco, this is Bay Bridge, this is Golden Gate Bridge, uh, this is UC Berkeley, somewhere down here. Here is my office, I'm not there anymore, I'm in my kitchen, uh, this is where, where I live, um, and usually it's full of clouds, it's probably our life, but uh, from time to time you can see it, see it in this way. Thank you so much. Great, great, Maria. Thank you very much for this really cool, cool, cool uh, talk and story. So I'll just remind you about the questions. So there are two ways of asking questions. The first one is you can type the question in the chat and I will try to read it and direct it to Maria. Or if you are more adventurous, you can raise your hand and ask the question directly by yourself and I will unmute you. Okay, but in the meantime, I can maybe start um, with a question. It's, so my question is about maybe more visualization. I was wondering mm -hmm. because you said about um, there is a lot of dynamics happening inside inside Proton. And I was wondering if there is a way to visualize this or talk about it in a, in a similar way, like quantum chemical calculations are done or like molecular dynamic simulations are done. So you can have like electrons uh, changing their orbitals or maybe atoms are moving. So I was wondering if there is any way even to, to start thinking or talking about the dynamics inside proton in a similar way. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure if it will be similar way because probably I'm not an expert, you know, in, uh, in chemistry here or the description in this way. Um, but you know, to some extent we are doing it, we just have to kind of understand how we read it. Because when you, for example, present, uh, you know, this parton distribution function and we say like, okay, we have partons moving at this particular momentum. Uh, we already described to like what momentum or how fast the, for example, quark is moving along the, uh, the, the beam line or along you know, the uh, direction of colliding protons. There is a whole um, you know, branch of um, spin physics and not only spin, generally proton structure uh, physics, which also uh, tries to describe the dynamics, as you said, or distribution also of the protons in the transverse direction. So if we slice it, you know, parallel to the colliding beams and look how partons are distributed there, how fast they are, they are moving, what's their momentum in this direction. Um, so these are kind of complementary uh, experiments which uh, can be done also with, with STAR or in the future electron ion collider. And the um, uh, final goal is to have the full proton 
let's say tomography, as you can think in this way, both in um, like space, so how far we are from the center of the proton and also in the momentum. So there would be like, we, we both know where the particles are located uh, in momentum. So how fast they are inside the proton and also uh, how far they are or where they are located in, in space, like in femtometers from the, from the center. So this is happening. It's a whole, um, you know, campaign of collecting data with uh, polarization, as I showed, with the polarization in the other direction. Um, and this is happening. But for the full, let's say, picture, we need, you know, first of all, of course, this is collaboration between experimentalists and theorists. And the second is, uh, you know, we need more particular data which can probe uh, different types of partons in the different kind of distribution of, of momentum inside the proton. So we are somehow there. <laughs> cool, okay, great, thank you. And we have already two questions from the chat. Yes. The first one is about the lifetime of quarks. Do we know anything about the lifetime of quarks? So quarks are, um, I mean, depending in which, sense, I would say. <laughs> I mean, quarks uh, inside the proton, they are confined and they are there. If we talk about, you know, quark and anti-quark pairs, they pop up and disappear very quickly. Um, and then they, uh, and they are, they are like, for example, a gluon can split to two quarks and then interact, uh, you know, back. Um, in the sense of the lifetime as the works, I don't know, decay, for example, um, you know, we can, we can talk, for example, about the, the heaviest quark, like a top quark, um, you know, the, it's a very peculiar quark, uh, which, okay, it, it's the heaviest one, so it, it has a very peculiar properties, and it can really, uh, it can really decay at some point, but, um, you know, in this sense, inside the proton, we more talk about quarks interacting or splitting to uh, to other, uh, for, for example, to radiating quark, uh, radiating gluons, or interacting with other gluons, or um, or for example, these quarks and anti quarks pairs popping up uh, and disappearing. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is answering the question. I hope. Yeah, I mean, we, we will see. Maybe there'll be a follow up. Yeah, if, yeah. If... It's not like decaying in the sense of like weak interactions. Mm -hmm. It's more, it's more we talk here inside Proton, we talk mostly about strong interactions. I see. Okay, there's another one from Christina. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. I was wondering how can you obtain a beam containing only protons? Yeah, so. Uh, Usually, I mean, th there are several ways uh, to produce beams. Usually we use the nuclear reactions, for example, which produce particular type of particles. It doesn't have to be protons. It can be, um, we can have different types of beams. These particles uh, generally, I mean, the best when they are stable, so we can, they will not decay and we can really, uh, we can really, collect them in our ring and just accelerate. So there's like a series of reactions which in the end uh, produce protons and then we are collecting them and then just accelerate uh, in, our, in our ring. The rings which are in the beginning of this kind of set of accelerator are usually called storage rings. So we just store, uh, store protons for, um, for some time when we, then they reach proper energy and we have enough of them and then we just send them uh, later to the other set of accelerators. So it's like a set of reactions which which produce protons in the end. It can be also it can be also like pion beam for example that there is there is uh, several beams can be produced. Okay cool thank you. Another one from Kasia. Uh, thanks for the fascinating talk and for making it so accessible. Oh, it's Ambulance, I was talking about. Yeah, welcome. Sorry, this is London. I can't even mute it. Okay, 
Uh, thanks for the fascinating talk and for making it so accessible. I have a question about the logistics of your work. I mm -hmm. don't know if you un if I understood it correctly. You mentioned publications with 500 authors. How do you organize the workload and ensure fairness, including among more junior researchers? Would you say yeah. it helps the atmosphere of collaboration or is it th there more competition? And finally, how do you take care of your technicians? They must be so precious and so important for this work. Oh, yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, it the the world of particle physics and you know um, big collaborations is very it's very specific, but I really like it. So uh, I mean, there are several like stages of this of this question. So first of all, um, yeah, we do have all these authors on our publication list, which I think makes it a bit healthier for all of us in the sense that uh, people in some sense, you know, what, what does it mean first author on the last author? I'm always last because I'm Jurek. So I'm, you know, in the alphabetical order, I'm always last. Doesn't mean that I'm a PI of the boss of the whole collaboration. So it's, it's very different. Um, we, um, in, so concerning like early career researchers and then later how you, you know, proceed in your career, um, usually they are like a main uh, principal authors which are responsible for the, pub, for the publication. And, you know, it is clear when you did the experiment uh, and when you, you know, presented it and when you um, like published your stuff, because, you know, you would be presenting it on several conferences, you will be writing about it, you will be talking about it, your PI will tell that you that you've done it, other collaborators will tell will tell that you've done it, it will be known in the uh, you know, community who was doing the particular analysis. If it was your PhD analysis, then you will have your PhD thesis about it. If it was further, you know, uh, in your career, then you will have it, you know, internally in the collaboration, you will be a principal author of this, of this publication. And then your collaborators, you know, write your recommendation letters and they tell which, uh, which paper you were co-authoring. You can ask also spokesperson of the collaboration, which, which uh, publication this person was, um, was co-authoring. Um, yeah, of course there are people, you know, complaining about this system in one or the other way. Uh, but I mean, personally, I like it. Personally, I think that there's really collaboration and without all these people, you know, this experiment would be not possible. Um, concerning, you know, technical uh, support, as you said, we had, you know, big numbers of engineers, especially when the detectors are being produced. Uh, additionally, you know, for the detector support itself, uh, many physicists in collaborations like that actually are somehow in the, on the border between working with hardware and uh, working with analysis. So some of them concentrate on uh, creating new detectors, but of course, you know, when the new thing is happening, um, then uh, we need lots of engineers. That is uh, true. Uh, some of them, if they are oriented more towards science, they can be also the part of the collaboration. Uh, some of them, they're just, you know, hired for, I don't know, assembling whole detector, uh, over a few years, they are it's just their project, which uh, which they they perform, and they are not part of the scientific collaboration. Um, and yeah, and there is like for example, every few months we have collaboration meeting, and when it's like in person, we have this four hundred people sitting together and discussing. Everything is organized in subgroups, so I'm like uh, chairing the the. Um, uh, cold spin and cold QCD group uh, together. So we meet weekly and we were doing, you know, the Zooming uh, before Zooming was fashionable because we simply have to meet with all the people around the world. My group is, uh, I mean, we have people from all around the US and lots of collaborators from China. That's why, you know, our meetings are Wednesday, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time and 4 p.m. here. Um, so there is lots of like logistics in this, also logistics with I don't know code development and all this kind of all the, all these kind of things. It's uh, 
it's a fun fun you know structure to be you have to understand it but for like early career scientists it can be sometimes difficult that's true you are in the big collaboration on the other hand you have lots of support from from around and there's really no like fight over who is on the paper because everyone is on the paper so this is good i think i hope i answered everything uh yes i think kasha even uh say <laughs> thank you again to you in, in the chat it said, uh thank you so there's there's a follow-up question yes. about the quarks mm -hmm. so it was about net quarks uh mm -hmm. but uh, i was thinking about the net quarks uh, but mm -hmm. are these then just dynamic structures i'm not sure okay well let me check into the chat maybe, yeah, maybe i'm not yeah, yeah that's okay it's from blue note very anonymous okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um yeah so okay maybe maybe i will i i am so maybe the question is okay if we talk about because i think this is the follow-up to the question about the decay if i'm like yes, correct the lifetime. Mm -hmm. so uh generally like quarks can decay in the sense of weak interaction so when you have for example like beta decay you no know, when for example the uh, neutron is decaying um and we have like proton uh and and beta particle electron in the end um then quarks uh, can also decay uh, they will be for example when we have uh they can decay for emission uh of this w boson so this is what's happening inside when you look at the beta decay in the end what's happening is the one quark just emitting w boson uh, changing into into the um, other flavor of, I mean, from up to down or to down to up, and then the electron and neutrino is uh, emitted. So in this sense, quarks can decay, and I think this was the question. So the valence quarks or any quarks inside the proton can uh, can really uh, really decay if this is this is the question the thing which i was talking about is more when the quarks are you know closed inside the proton and they are dynamically dynamically living there and they are interacting and they are changing their color all the time uh, in this sense but indeed if we if we have like neutron and we see the beta decay this is what's happening is in the end happening on the like quark level So I okay. hope we know that this is the this is the proper proper about this and yeah okay. I think we will we, we will we will see uh, but so okay. if if anyone else has um, question just let us maybe, maybe I mean maybe I can add one more thing because like mm -hmm. when you think about decay we think about like that something decays to something smaller like so far we know that part I mean that quarks are fundamental so in this sense they cannot like decay to a uh in the sense like for example um i don't know the nucleus will decay to pro to quark to protons and neutrons so by the i mean by the decay here it will be just more in sort of interaction that one quark em emits the w uh, and there are the interaction between between two quarks and then for example um for example um you know electrons and neutrinos are uh, generated but in the sense of like decaying to something smaller than not because as far as we know quarks are uh fundamental so maybe this was actually the question i hope that this was okay cool thanks <laughs> thanks a lot for this very uh, very extended uh, informative answer I don't see any other questions. So maybe just a closing up question from me. Is there any other ex particle physics experiment in the near future which you are super excited? Apart from the one you are you just mm -hmm. said about the build the electro ion one. Is there any mm -hmm. other one which you are super excited? So there are lots of experiments which are currently working and they will be providing you know important data, also LHC with the new runs. 
So usually, you know, big big experiments work in the way that there is you no know, first run when you collect lots of data. Then some detectors are being uh, upgraded, some things are being changed, some new possibilities are being added to the measurements and detector in general, and there are new data being collected. There will be new, in lots of new, interesting data also from heavy ion collisions at at LHC uh, soon, uh, you know, from our, from my, let's say, field, of course, you know, electron ion collider is there. Uh, there will be also next experimental run with our star detector with a uh, forward upgrade where we will be able to measure particles in a bit forward direction. That's why going, you know, a bit deeper uh, into the into the proton, which is also exciting. And actually the assembly of the detector just finished at Brookhaven. Uh, I think this happened, this, this finish, just, just me, it was just press, press release yesterday. Uh, so I think this would be also super, super exciting. And there are also lots of possibilities at a bit lower energies uh, at Jefferson, Jefferson Lab, also here in the US. Uh, these are not particularly new experiments, but they, are, they have also upgraded in the energy of the colliding uh, particles. So I think that this, uh, this will be, this will be also very exciting. <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for a great talk and for your time uh, to hang out with us for questions.